Okay, Alex. All right, Joe, here we go. Ready? Sure. Good morning. This is Damon Lester, president of NAVMAT, the National Association of Minority Automobile Dealers. Today we have an amazing guest presenter who's going to discuss the past, present, and future of auto adapting in an industry that keeps demanding more of us. Please welcome the CEO of Dealer Inspire, Mr. Joe Chura. Here you go, Joe. All right. Hey, Damon, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, everyone, for attending on this Thursday. I think it's Thursday. These days seem to blend together now, but I really appreciate your time, and it's an honor to be here. So I'm going to go through the past, present, and future of automotive today, if, if uh, you bear with me. So let's start in the past, how dealers used to win. We're not going to go this far back, but I don't know if you can see the Model T, uh, the Henry Ford Model T in the back of my, my office here to remind me of where, where we have come from. So it's been, uh, it's been uh, quite an adventure over the last 100 plus years. And uh, again, I'm looking forward to, to going through it. I will take you back to 1998. And life seems so much more simple then. Uh, I was hired as an assembler on the Chicago assembly plant to help build the 1998 Ford Taurus. And I'm sure many of you have toured or been to an assembly plant. If not, it's a real treat. If at the time in 1998, uh, the Taurus was actually the number one selling vehicle in America, believe it or not. And, and the way the assembly line worked is the cars would just constantly roll at 72 cars per hour. And when it got to your station, it didn't stop or anything. They would just constantly move. So it was, a, it was, a, it was a crazy first day, first week, uh, the first few months there. I didn't think I could keep up with the, how fast things were moving there. I was in charge too of an important part, putting in, screwing in the seatbelt, the, the scuff plate and a B pillar, and, uh, and a few other things for, for the Taurus and the Mercury Montego. So, so that's, a, that's a, you know, a brand we haven't heard about in a while. But after about a month or so on the line, I realized that it just wasn't for me long term. Though it was a fantastic job. So I, I was faced with one choice to, to go to school. Um, at the time, I started off working on the assembly line uh, growing up on the south side of Chicago. Uh, finding out I was going to be a father at, at, at the age of uh, 19. So I was like, I can't quit this job. I, it has great benefits, but it, it allowed me a path to get my degree in business. Um, after five years, though, that's how long it took me. I was able to finagle my way. And I say finagle because there's a, another long story about how I was able to get from the assembly line to the marketing sales division at Ford. But I had the opportunity to start working with four dealers. And it was really exciting. I, I cherished the opportunity have, having come from the assembly line. My first zone was in outstate Illinois. And I learned under fire big time how dealerships worked. My primary job was to wholesale vehicles to dealers, but also really work on their profitability and ensure they were maximizing it, which at the time was a bit of a conundrum. <laughs> because we were trying to push as many vehicles out as possible and wholesale as, as many. And as many of you may recall from that time, there was a surplus of inventory, but the demand wasn't as high. My other responsibility was to ensure dealers knew how to use the internet to sell cars. And most of this time in early 2000 was spent convincing the dealerships that the internet wasn't gonna become a fad. Some, some actually argued me, but, but many got it. What I found was two things along this journey. Insight number one was dealers were just throwing money at advertising. They were very reactive. And number two was organic traffic. And I had the highest internet, had the highest ROI online. So those are, those are people coming to the website, coming to, to the store, not being prompted by really any advertising. After five years as a rising zone manager, I was promoted to the incentive and distribution team at Ford Motor Company. But immediately right after that, I fell into a golden opportunity. I was asked to join a dealer group and become a GM and a partner. I jumped at the chance because I thought, how hard could this be? After all, I was consulting dealers for the last five years. Well, 
I'm here to tell you that it was the toughest job I, have, I ever had. In fact, if you read, if you, uh, I'm sure you know what that piece of paper is, but that's a four square. And I was handed that my first day and asked to approve the deal. And I had no idea what it was. It was just a big Sharpie marker on a piece of paper with four squares. And I, I signed off on it and I was hoping that the finance manager wasn't trying to test me. But it was a, it was a great lesson that despite my previous experience, I had a lot to learn in front of me. And also I fell into the same trap that I was consulting against. Because our group believed mostly in direct mail advertising. If sales were slow for a given month, I would have my direct mail company on speed dial. And I remember talking to this guy named Jeff and I'd say, Jeff, let's send out a saturation piece, which is something I came to learn as send out as much mail as possible to a targeted area. And that targeted area was the county in which the, the dealership was in because the population in the city was, was only 5,000 people. And with a lucky 1% conversion rate for, the, for them to just come in, not even necessarily buy a car, I always wondered what happened in that extra 99%. I also filmed commercials to try and break, break the, the noise like this. So I warned Damon that most of this presentation is me embarrassing myself. And that was the case in point. <laughs> that actually happened the first week. A, a camera crew came in the, the dealership and asked about the commercial we were supposed to film. The previous GM didn't tell me we were filming a commercial. So I made that up on the spot. It was political season. I thought it was timely and fun. But, you know, I'm not sure what it generated in terms of, a, of an ROI. But despite my, these kind of rogue attempts at marketing, I found what I thought was the secret in 2010. And it was to create content and a lot of it. At that time, I transitioned to, uh, to a, Ford, a Ford dealer group. And, and really what I concentrate on is shooting videos, videos that answer consumers' questions. And to this day, this channel still exists. It's, it's on YouTube, your Ford dealer, and has, it has over a million views. And they are horribly edited, and they're all over the place, but, but the reality is some of them have gotten 500,000, 600,000 visitors to them because I'm simply answering customers' question. Like this one here, I think has 600,000 visitors and all I'm doing is showing that Ford was gonna get rid of their gas cap. And I did that because I felt like consumers were gonna get in, in their new car, go to pump gas in it and think that it, the gas cap was missing. So what do consumers do? They go to Google, YouTube, and they ask, they ask that search engine a question, and then my video came up as the answer. I also did, did things like create these kind of micro websites. And, and I haven't touched this website in over 10 years, and it still ranks on, on page one for phrases like Ford employee discount. And while it may not seem like much, just answering employees' questions about the A plan on a website was able to generate about 10 to 20,000 visitors per month it fluctuated quite a bit and 300 extra leads per month for, for this dealership. And while some weren't relevant, a lot were. And it allowed us to rise in terms of, in terms of how we rank for, for internet sales. And in 2010, we went from not even showing up on this report to being the number two ranked dealer in the Chicago region. So I tell you all this to say, I made a lot of mistakes along the way. Hopefully you guys can understand some of those fun moments when you're reactive, you're having a slow sales month and you're like, what can I do? But, but the reality is when I started to really think about what's gonna drive a long-term ROI, not be reactive, producing content was a big thing back then. So thinking about the success we had, I, I, I thought, why can't I do this for other dealerships? So just like a storybook, I created a company out of my basement in Elgin, Illinois. And we really focused on just efficient connected marketing, holistic search engine optimization, SEM, personalized email, and unique creative. But there was something missing. Dealers still didn't have a great connected experience. Well, this marketing 
existed and was solid, there's a disconnected website experience. Meaning if you clicked on an ad on the very top there in that example where it says great marketing, and then you went to the website, there's nothing to describe what that ad, what, what that ad is or what the, what the customer clicked on. It was very disconnected. And I realized again that you can waste even more money than direct mail or TV if you don't have a better streamlined experience for consumers. So I started to think of an acronym of how I could remember this. Because after all, it all starts with the destination. And all too often, marketing companies and dealerships and even myself back then, we all started with advertising. Where to advertise? And then you think about the destination second. But it really needs to start off with the destination. Then you need to figure out how to measure. What are you going to look at as the desired outcomes and how are you going to know if something's working? And then if, after you do those two things, then you begin advertising. Let me give you an example of the importance of conversion rate and thinking through the, the destination. So imagine your website for simple math gets a thousand visitors at a 1% conversion rate. That equals 10 conversions, right? And you can do one of two things. You could double the traffic. Typically when you want to double the traffic, what do you do? you spend more money to generate more traffic. And you could do that through paid search, social media advertising, variety of ways. If you double the traffic at a 1% conversion rate, you still you get 20 conversions, you double it, but it could probably costs you a bit of money. However, you take that same amount of traffic and you're able to increase the conversion to 2%, you still get 20 conversions and you haven't spent anything more. So, so think about the conversion of not just necessarily and an uh, internet ad going to your website, but just think about what you're advertising out there and what a consumer is experiencing when they walk into your dealership or call or email. So the result is great marketing has to be connected with a great website experience, but that still doesn't give you complete success. Today at present, you have to be fast. Speed truly wins you have to help customers instantly. And what you really wanna look at is what's the main goal of your website? Yes, to drive outcomes like sales, leads, et cetera. But for a consumer, it's to get them answers to their questions. Just like I showed with that Ford employee plan website, just like I did with creating those videos, it's still the same thing, although we're in a different age now. But among the top of these questions is, can I afford it? Turns out, 75% of consumers won't contact or visit a dealership until they know if they can afford the vehicle based on their personal financial needs. I think we can all understand why price is important. It's not the only factor that shoppers consider. If it was, we'd all be driving Chevy Cruises, right? It's okay, I can make, I can make Chevy jokes. I used to, sh to, shell, to sell Chevys too. But that, that said, answering the can I afford it question is usually the first question shopper needs to answer in order for them to deem it's even worthwhile to go down the research path. Well, it's nice to dream. If you can't afford it, you're not going to waste much time thinking about it. And let me just say this. Can I afford it question isn't a new one. It's been there. And it's why some people were enticed to do this. So in this example, imagine Julio is on your website. He's about to have another child and he needs a bigger car for under $500 a month. We can all imagine a scenario where this is, where this is true. The shopper used to go on the website and have to submit a lead to find the answer. They could go to submit and, and find out um, through, through an e-price. So, so typically websites have these e-price forms, you complete the form and you may or may not get a response in some given time period. And you know, the, the goal is obviously for your dealerships, and I'm sure you instill SLAs that you say, hey, when someone submits a lead form, I need you to respond to them within a half hour or an hour, right? I know when I was doing it myself, it was, it was my internal SLA was, I need to get back to these people within an hour. But if you think about it, this was 2010, 2011, an hour is forever. You can order your groceries and get them delivered in an hour to get a simple answer back online. An hour just doesn't work anymore. Well, I know there's a lot of chatter about digital, about digital retailing. What, what, what dealerships really need to focus on first is ans just simply answering these questions. 
It's about how we can take this to the next level and be more transparent faster. So the ability for your website to answer questions like this and for a consumer to scroll to say, hey, here's, the, here's what I can afford based on this scenario in my life, like the example I gave that Julio is about to have a child, needs a third row seat and can afford something that's around $500. You need to give those answers quick. And this all starts with rethinking of your forms. What worked a few years ago and still may work today will unlikely work tomorrow. 67% of customers we're seeing would rather message a business than email or call. And I think you've all, you've all kind of faced this too, right? Where, where you can call someone multiple times, it goes to email, but they'll text you immediately. I know my children are, are like that. Like they just don't like to answer the phone, but they'll text me all day long. And you need to provide instant automated answers. We need to be able to provide answers and be able to do this everywhere to where a consumer is, which I'll get to in a minute. That's what common sense says. So if you look at this, the faster and easier consumer experience will win. But in the past, the data has proved me dead wrong. So we had to test this. So we set up two groups of accounts to compare. The first is A, using that standard giddy price form, which is on many websites today. And the second CTA, promising an instant experience. Once you, once you click, our AI bot asks for the information and it gives you the price instantly in the moment. And here's what we found. The instant experience increased conversion rate by 40%. So job done right, right? The bucket's fixed and we've maximized ROI. But there's a lot more you can still do here. So I want to introduce you to a concept that hopefully you write down. I'm pretty sure we coined this. I'm not sure. I'm not 100%, but I'm pretty sure, called native conversion. In simple terms, it's creating an experience where the consumer is. So just imagining, just imagine it, that you're sitting with your spouse at night and they're scrolling on Facebook. And the average amount someone scrolls on Facebook equates to 300 yards on a football field, but it's using someone's thumb and not their legs. So think about that. Someone's just scrolling through a native Facebook feed on their mobile phone, 300 yards on a daily basis. That, that's a lot. And all of a sudden you see a dealership ad and that dealership ad saying, hey, why don't you get off here? Even though I know, I know you have 200 more yards to, to scroll and go to my website. What we need to start thinking about is, is how do we convert a customer where they're at and not expect them to go to another place? And that again is why native conversion makes a lot of sense here. Again, in simple terms, it's creating an experience where the consumer is. Less clicks equal more conversions. We've seen, we've seen this with Facebook uh, ads. So Facebook has a lead gen ad product that allows a consumer to write there in Facebook natively through an ad, interact, and submit their information right there. And that, that could go to your CRM and then the person can continue on with their day. So I just go to, that just goes to show you that it, this is a really important place to start thinking about your advertising. It's not always drive someone to your website and, and have them convert there, is converting natively to where they're at. And over the last few years, we've actually connected Facebook Messenger to our chat and messaging tool to provide this experience and enhance it on Facebook. So the consumer is on Facebook, they, they start to chat. Instead of Facebook auto-responding, it actually flows into our system and a dealership can respond right there real time or they can use our AI bot to help answer questions and vet out that, that consumer to understand what they want. And you can also do this through SMS. So just imagine that you have a big billboard and that billboard has a text phone number on it. And it says, text this number to get an instant trade in value or text this number to communicate anything with said dealership. A customer can simply open their, their phone, natively text a number, and then they can have that same experience natively without even visiting a dealer's website. And this is available also in Google My Business. It's, it's being uh, tweaked right now, so Google's gonna put this in Maps, but you can also do this right, right through Google Maps. So you, you can chat with the business, and we have the tools to connect that, that experience so a dealership can answer it and there's not a lead just sitting there in an email inbox. And, and really, when you think about the future, 
because that is what I would consider present. I firmly believe that as vehicles and prices become more commoditized, the best connected experience is going to win the day. So what you need to do is to think about selling your experience, promote your experience, back up your experience and get, get reviews on it. Consumers are engaging more with dealers who offer safe, easy, and digital customer experiences right now. Things like video chat, online buying, which we have on Deal Inspire websites, home delivery, which is on cars.com, uh, on thousands of, of listings, if not, if not a million listings, that allow a consumer to know that they can get home delivery right on cars.com's marketplace. Also, if you're promoting online buying, make sure your experience is more than a fancy lead form. You need to have real payments, real-time collaboration, and a, a way for a consumer to at least sign a form online to get vested in this process. The progress your shoppers make online has to connect with their in-store experience. And this is vital. This is vital. Over the last few years, as we launched our digital retailing product on top of our website, what we noticed is that the dealership behavior hasn't changed. So consumers doing all this work online, yet when they walk into a dealership, it's almost like they have to start over. And the best recommendation that I can give you here is test this. Test it as a consumer, create a fake Gmail address. Or better yet, my, my wife is really good at being critical on things in, a, in the most positive way possible. And I ask her, hey, go through this as a consumer. Because we're, we're knee deep in auto, right? Like we understand automotive very well, but to understand more consumer behavior, you have to ask someone from the outside. It's hard when you're inside the bottle to see the label. So that's what's happening today where we need to have deeper engagement online, like someone customizing their own payment. The ability to have this personalization, you've heard this a million times from Amazon and Netflix, how important personalization is. Well, that's like, that's a, that's a payment, right? So if I go to a website and it shows me, hey, here's, a, here's the payment that, that I can afford, like a Savine rate, 0% for 72 on a Chevy truck, right? But I might not qualify for that. So what is it for me based on my credit, based on my scenario? That is vital for a consumer and the technology is there today to make that happen. But in this case, like I had mentioned before, if you start configuring this online, you go to the sales floor, in most cases, what I've seen is there's a big disconnect. It's that disconnected consumer experience. And typically the salesperson says, hey, let's just start over. That is not a great consumer experience and that's one we all need to work on. My last, my last analogy, I promise, I love using pictures of my daughter in my presentation. So this is my daughter, Morgan. She asked for a pizza the other night and I gave her the responsibility of choosing some ingredients. We looked through the menu, we explored options and she started building the pizza online by adding ingredients and toppings one by one. We were finally done, we hit order, we high-fived each other, Morgan, great job. And imagine Morgan shows up at the pizza place for the in-store pickup. And after doing all that work and waiting patiently for it to be made, the guy behind the counter, completely started over the conversation and asked us, what would you like on your pizza? He had no record of our order and our time was just wasted. So just imagine that, but you're talking about the purchase of a vehicle, not a pizza. So this is how you can make that happen. One, I, I want you to think about check-in devices for consumers. How do you know, how are you checking your up logs? How are you tracking consumers walking into your dealerships? And this has a lot more benefits than that streamlined experience. Well, one, it allows you to monitor things in a much different way. If you're still handwriting your up logs, I strongly urge you to use technology that's available today to help you. Secondly, you need an internet connection. I know you all have that, you're on this presentation. And third, you have a website, which I know you have a website. So you, you would be in great shape. And you give the consumer to log in from any device at any time to, pick up where the experience left off. Last thing they want to do is start their deal online, then go to another device or later on try and pick it up because they got interrupted and they need to start over again. That is very frustrating. We've all been there. 
um, and just put yourself in that consumer's shoes. So how you win is simply picking up where the consumer left off. We treat everyone like they have to do 90% in the store. But zoom out and connect the entire journey. Get, and then finally, get reviews of, of your experience. And this, from my experience, is a numbers game. You miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Stole that off Wayne Gretzky, of course. But it's a numbers game in the sense that you have to create a process and you have to ask for reviews on your customers every day. And obviously you want to vet out the unhappy customers. That's not a reality. You don't want those published online. But also I would, I would say when you do th see things online, it's an opportunity to reach out to that customer and the dealers that are winning are reacting very quick to this. And spread reviews across platform and promote your results. Many dealerships as a best practice use their reviews on these websites right on the homepage of their, of their website to showcase that they're a reputable, trusted dealership. So again, spread them across all platforms, responding to all of them, and then promoting the results, as I just mentioned. And as vehicles become more commoditized, which is gonna happen because of the, the increase of production of electronic vehicles, I firmly believe that in the future future, not flying, but electric cars are going to change the game. And here's, here's what I think is going to happen. So what to watch out for. EV vehicles will enable consumers to hang on to their vehicles much longer, which will reduce significantly, I think, what happens in the service department. So think about oil changes and how many times a customer is in there. You get the opportunity to see a customer often for something like that. But by 2035, and this is very timely, California just announced that every vehicle has to have zero emissions, which, which I'm not sure how feasible that is. And I think cars will be registered to nearby states in many cases. But the reality is, regardless, there's gonna be a big push and you're gonna see the market share of electric vehicles changing significantly. So I would say that in thinking about electric vehicles, Think about how you can start to take care of that customer because they are coming. I do think we have, we have time now. <laughs> then next is the 5G and, and connected car. So if you've heard about IoT or Internet of Things, this is very, very important. And the connected car is going to able, be able to catch connectivity issues early. It's going to allow things to be fast to reduce impact on customer satisfaction and service quality. Because the car, instead of the customer being reactive to something in the car and then calling the dealership, the dealership's going to have advanced warning that, hey, this is going on in that customer's vehicle, and you're going to be able to reach out to that customer. Some of this exists today, but this is going to be significantly compounded because IoT devices are skyrocketing. You've seen many of them. Many of them you could buy off the shelf and plug in your vehicle to give you vehicle diagnostics. But what I'm talking about is the proactive sense of the car talking to the, the dealership before the customer even knows what's wrong, which will consequently lower, lower warranty costs and uh, save, save OEM's money. But that also means that the service lanes may not be as busy or they'll be busy earlier. Number three is uh, this will be able to speed up resolution time to detect the cell networks and issues to determine, hey, is this a network issue or software issue? And it'll also allow real-time feedback to improve these vehicles. So if you think of, if you have a Mac or you have a PC, like it's always updating, it's always, it's always uh, you know, providing new software. And this is no different. Your vehicle is gonna be more software. Like Tesla considers themselves a software company, not an automotive company. And, and that is really the, the future of where EVs are going. But I'm, I just want you to think about how that's gonna affect your service department. And three, I think this is important for everything you do. Just ask yourself, what if scenarios? What if, what if you didn't have a website? How would you transact business? Not that you're not going to, I don't want to put that fear. It would, that, would be, that would be bad for us, right? But what if that happened? How can you communicate to consumers properly? How can you have that connected experience without a website? 
what if dealerships look different in the future? You don't have to house all that inventory. Because of EVs, it's more real-time on-demand production. You know, all of those things, you just need to have like a what-if session and start thinking about, not, not to necessarily change the game tomorrow, but, but to start planning to say, hey, what, what can the goalpost be for my dealership? And then work towards that. So that is what I have today. I think, I think Damon, right at the 30 minute mark. So I'm happy to answer any questions and appreciate everyone's time. Thank you, Joe. Everyone, uh, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature. Um, and Joe, that was awesome. I just got a quick question for you. So what you were mentioning about the pizza example, which is so true, like, so is, is it a form of AI technology that it's able to determine what you're thinking before actually doing it? So, so when you click on the, um, like that, that example of the giddy price button, the AI recognizes that, hey, this consumer wants an instant price right now. And, and from that point, we created like what we call a bot flow to then fetch from the bot a different price from the dealership's IMS. So a dealership can have multiple prices in there. They tell us which one they want. And that allows us to uh, be able to create that. So it's not so much thinking before, but it's thinking, hey, they click on this button and they want this action. Now, the, the other benefit to that is, as many dealers on this call know, that you there's a lot of compliance around, around showing uh, a lower than map price, right, Damon? So like, so like manufacturers say, you cannot advertise the price of this Mercedes below this, this line. Well, if you have the ability to provide an instant lower price, that's a one-on-one -on -one interaction, you can do that. You just can't advertise it. So that's actually the, how we created this, this technology was... I don't want to say to get around compliance, but it was to provide that one-on-one -on -one answer, but much quicker than a giddy price form. That's awesome. Well, man, I, I appreciate it. We don't have any cute questions here. Um, but as yeah. always, like all of our, our webinars, we will be sending this out for your viewing um, on our website sometime tomorrow afternoon. Joe, thank you very much. Thank you, Dealer Inspire. Thank you, Alex Vetter from cars.com. Appreciate it. And, um, it, and Joe, it, please welcome to the family. Hey, thanks, Sam. I want to give a shout out to, to my friend Rick, who's on. I was actually his Ford rep way back when. So uh, <laughs> I don't know if he tuned in for, for the beginning, but I hope you watch this, Rick. It's, it's, it's great to see you. He was the, one of the dealers I called on in outstate Illinois. So it's, uh, it's awesome to see names from the past. Well, thank you. Hey, Robbie Turner. And uh, thanks again. Joe, have a good day. Everyone be safe. Please keep those masks on and um, enjoy the rest of the week. Take care. All right. All right. Thanks, everyone. Take care.